You guys, welcome to D&D Optimized, the show where each episode we take a deep dive into a single character build for Dungeons & Dragons 5e, and we theorycraft on it, and we do our best to crunch numbers and make it as powerful as possible in-game for your chosen role. Um, if you love theory crafting, if you, like me, uh, love character creation in Dungeons & Dragons 5e almost as much as playing the game itself, then welcome home. Uh, this is this is a place for you. So, um, super excited to have you. Thanks for being here. My name is Colby, and I have uh, I have missed you guys, which seems like an odd thing to say because I have never actually met any of you, or many of you, most of you, anyway. Um, but you know what? That's how I feel. So there. Um, it's been a couple of weeks since we've done a full episode. So I am so excited for the episode today. Um, oh my gosh. Uh, more excited, I would say, than I've been about any build maybe since um, Bladesinger. So uh, let's get into it. I've had a lot of requests over the last few weeks and months now um, to do a grappler build. Um, so let's talk about it. What What is grappling? What's so great about, about having a character that's a dedicated grappler? Um, so for those who don't know, when you make a grapple attack in game, um, it's a special attack. It's it, If you have multiple attacks, it's, it takes one of them, but it is the attack action. You take the attack action, you make this special attack. Um, and basically, you, you have a strength contest, um, an athletics contest, and uh, if you succeed, then the target is grappled, and it keeps them from moving. Um, it requires at least one free arm, so you have to have a free arm to, to be able to grab somebody with. Um, and uh, they, get to, they, they, they get to choose, the enemy gets to choose whether they make a, an athletics check to, to, to succeed against your check, your athletics check, or an acrobatics check. Um, and if you can reliably grapple an enemy, it provides um, some nice benefits. Um, you hold them still, so they can't move, right? Um, and potentially, thereby keeping them from attacking other people if they're far away from them, or, even, or at least five feet away from them, because they can't move. They still can attack, they can attack you, right? Or maybe even somebody that's standing next to you, if they're also standing next to the enemy. Um, but um, it can be a great way to, to control. You can move them at half speed when somebody's grappled. You've got an enemy grappled. You can move them at half of your speed. You kind of drag them along. So you could potentially put them in harm's way of something. You could move them away, further away from your more vulnerable allies. You could even potentially drop them off a cliff, right? Um, and so, uh, and if they want to break the grapple, if the enemy wants to break the grapple, it requires an action on their part. Um, so you potentially keep them from attacking if they're they're trying to break out of your grapple. Um, so lots of lots of great benefits um, and a nice control option for a character who uh, maybe doesn't traditionally have a lot of control options because they're not a spellcaster, right? Um, now there are some potential drawbacks to being a a grappler character. Um, like I said before, you need to have at least one arm free um, to be able to grapple, and so that prohibits you from using two-handed weapons, right? So any two-handed weapon damage dealers can't grapple and make a two-handed weapon attack um, on the target that's grappled. And again, since you, since you need at least one arm to be grappling them, you can also not use two-weapon fighting, right? Um, at least one arm has to be occupied with the grapple. You could, you know, make weapon attacks with, with your other hand, but no two-weapon fighting there. And so, enter the monk. Um, the monk, as we all know, um, does not attack with two-handed weapons. Um, so they're not hurt by that. And they also, th their bonus action, unlike a two-weapon fighter, their bonus action is weaponized, but in the form of an unarmed strike. 
uh, which can be made with a headbutt, an, a, a knee, a kick, right? So it doesn't necessarily require your hands. Um, which is why I think, for my money, the monk is, is the best grappler in the game if you're also concerned about damage. Um, a lot of you probably don't believe that statement, but bear with me. Um, because, because yes, the monk's DPR, their damage per round, is, generally speaking, a little bit underwhelming. Um, but, but at the very least, it doesn't suffer here if you build them to be a grappler. Now, more importantly, uh, Wizards of the Coast introduced some really nice things with Tasha's um, to buff unarmed attacks and monk attacks. Um, and it gives them some really nice synergy, some, some amazing synergy, in fact, um, with what we're trying to do here, which is grapple enemies while still putting out, you know, decent damage per round, sustainable damage. Um, and, you know, if you build it right, um, the, the, the DPR you put out, frankly, is um, superb. So, without further ado, I present episode 23, The Grappler Monk. Actually, I have an ado. I have one ado. Unlike my other monk build, um, the Munger, or Kensei Monk, this character is going to be going very heavy multi-classing. Um, for one main reason. So, as, as most of us know, the monk, although they get some really cool and fun and unique um, abilities and utility type abilities, especially in the mid and late game, um, their, their damage per round really plateaus kind of in the mid game and, and beyond. Um, if you just go mostly monk, right? With, the, with that first monk build that I did, um, I wanted to, you know, do decent sustained damage, but also be kind of as monkey as possible. Um, like I've done with my uh, bard and like Beastmaster builds, right? This time, I really wanted to, you know, A, make a fantastic grappler, but B, really see how far I could push the monks sustained damage per round. Um, the, the, the nice thing about monks is they do get a lot of attacks per round, especially if you use your key points to do flurry of blows. Um, by level five, you can be doing four attacks per round, which is great. And so I think the, the best way to sort of build on that strength is to find, a, find ways to add damage per attack abilities. And so and so I'm dipping into a lot of classes to try and pick up as many buffs to each attack as possible. Um, while still keeping sort of the core of the monk abilities intact and, and, and more importantly, um, picking up everything that we need to be a really great grappler, because that was sort of the point here. It just turns out that you can have your cake and eat it too, in this case, be a great grappler and do really fantastic damage. Um, the results are surprising. Uh, this is the hardest hitting monk I've ever seen, um, especially once you get into level seven through, you know, 13 or so. Um, so mid game and into a little bit into the high or late game, um, and and especially at kind of mid enemy armor class and, and above. In fact, at those points, um, I think it's better than any other build I've done, as far as sustained damage per round. Um, I know, I'm just as shocked as you are. So let's get into the build. Okay, at level one. Um, Class, we're gonna start off with Monk. You could start with Fighter. Um, we'll get into that in a second. But we're gonna start Monk um, here, and for your race, look, there are a lot of fun and interesting options to do here, and actually useful and good options here for race. And I'm gonna get into alternatives at the end during my like final thoughts segment, but for the build, it's very important to have two feats, and uh, you know, delaying those just really, really hurts. Especially with all the multi-classing we're doing, we're not going to have nearly enough feats and ability score increases for this character. So, I want to start variant human or custom lineage. 
um, and um, you know, check out check out the the alternative suggestions at the end. Um, but for the free feet, of course, we're going to say go custom lineage and do a custom elf or a custom half elf, thereby qualifying you for the elven accuracy feat, and that will be the free feat that you take now. Um, the plus one, the plus one ability bonus that you get from Elven Accuracy will go to Wisdom. Um, and if if taking if taking Custom Lineage cannot qualify you for a feat with a racial prerequisite at your table, um, then I would go Variant Human instead, and for your free feat, take Grappler. Um, or take one of the races that I mentioned in my final thoughts at the end. Uh, but I'm going to assume that we're that we're able to do the custom custom half elf um, or elf with uh, elven accuracy abilities. Your ability scores. Um, you want um, again. I always assume point by. We're going 15 wisdom, 14 dex, 13 charisma, and 13 strength. Yes, the build is super mad, uh, multiple ability score dependent, whatever whatever that acronym, acronym stands for, um, multiple ability dependency, uh, and and it hurts a lot. It does, um, especially with our really low constitution. Um, it'll be worth it eventually, but um, yeah, if if you roll for stats and you get a really nice line of um, mid to high uh, stats from your role, and you're looking for a for a character build to to take advantage of that. This is a really good one. Um, for equipment, right now all you need is a short sword, and you won't even need that for long. Um, I, I would just recommend going with gold buy and um, you know save your money or donate it to your friends. Uh, for your skill proficiencies, I, I never talk about this, but make sure in your skill proficiencies you are you become proficient whether through your background or just what's given to you as a monk. Um, grab athletics, and uh, because that will buff our um, grapple checks and, and make sure that we that we succeed on our grapple uh, grapple checks grapple attacks uh, more often. So at level one, monks get a couple of cool features. First off, you get unarmored defense. Which lets your it makes your AC equal to 10 plus your Dex modifier plus your Wisdom modifier, which is very important for us. So you are at a 16 armor class here, um, and that's not bad for naked, right? For for no armor. Um, bad news is it's not going to go up for a long time. So I hope you have a healer, especially with our low constitution. We are going to be squishy, and that's the number one drawback to this build. Um, also, monks get martial arts at level one. So when you take the attack action, you can, as a bonus action, make an unarmed strike, which does a d4 of damage. Also, your unarmed strikes can use your dexterity score instead of your strength score, um, which is important for us because we we have a very low strength. Oh, sorry. Well, it's a 13. It's not as good as our dex, which is 14. Um, so it's better, and we're, we're, we are a little weak as a level 1 character, and will be for a few levels actually. Um, not, not, not terrible, but just not fantastic, um, because we prioritized wisdom over dexterity. It'll make sense eventually. Alright, at level 2, we are starting our multiclassing early, and, and we're taking a level of fighter. Now, I know, it's heresy to multi-class before you get your extra attack. Um, you can wait until level 6 if you really have to. Uh, the main reason we're taking a fighter dip is for the shiny, new, as per Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, fighting style, unarmed fighting. Um, unarmed fighting gives us some really nice things. One, it lets us use, it lets our unarmed strikes use a d8 instead of a d4. Um, which is a, a really nice buff for us very early. Um, yes, it says it, it says in the in the explanation to the unarmed fighting style we get to use a d8 plus strength, um, but we've already been told by our mar martial arts that we can use dex instead of strength when making unarmed strikes, so this should not be a problem. Um, 
it's a d8 when we're not wielding a weapon or or a shield and since we're monks we're not using either to get rid of that short sword um, so that's really really nice admittedly you know at monk 11 monk level 11 our martial arts die it becomes a d8 anyway and so some people might argue well this isn't that great because you know in in 11 levels we'll already be there so it's a wasted you know fighting style I mean, we're not going to hit Monk 11 until very late game. So it is a nice buff for us now and throughout most of the game to be hitting with, with D8s on all of our unarmed strikes. Um, also, the, the unarmed fighting style gives us a nice little benefit of letting you, at the beginning of your turn, do a D4 of damage to a target that you have grappled. Um, there's no attack roll, there's no saving throw, it's just a d4 of damage. That's not a ton, but um, this build is all about finding small little incremental bumps to our damage, and this is one of them, and, uh, and it's nice, and it's free. Um, so we're going to go ahead and take that. At level 3, we're going back to monk. Um, so uh, we are a monk 2. And we now get our key points. Key is the expendable resource that all monks get. Think of it as a, maybe like a spell slot almost that, that empowers our coolest and uh, abilities as a monk, right? Um, they're great. <sighs> Little soapbox moment. One of the biggest problems with monks in 5th edition D&D, I think, is... is the, the abilities that are fueled by key are nice but you probably don't get enough key. I think that is maybe the easiest way to fix monks would be to, to give them a little more, maybe three key points every two levels instead of one per level, something like that. Um, but anyway, it, it, it just, yeah. Okay, getting off my soapbox. Um, you can use key to do a few things here at this level. One, you can do flurry of blows, which lets you get two unarmed strikes as a bonus action instead of one um, if you use a key point right that's awesome will be a great source of damage for us um, you can also spend a key point to do what's called patient defense which lets you take the dodge action as a bonus action so now you can make an attack and then dodge um, which would give your enemies disadvantage on attacks against you, right? That's nice as a bonus action. It does cost you a key point. Um, or you get Step of the Wind, which um, lets you spend a key point, and then you can disengage or dash as a bonus action, just like rogues get at level 2 for free, except for we have to spend our precious expendable resources. Um, anyway, key resets on a short rest which is great, um, so get used to taking lots of short rests because you're going to need those key points. Um, also at monk two, monk level 2, we get unarmored movement. Um, we get 10 more feet of move speed, and monks, uh, you know, monks get more move speed than any other class in the game, and that actually synergizes pretty nicely with being a grappler because, as I've already mentioned, when you've got somebody grappled, you can drag them. It's just you drag them at half your move speed, basically. Um, and so it just lets us drag our enemies a little bit further if we need to. At level four, monk three, this is where it all starts to come together. And, and if it were me, I would, I would want to start this character at level four. Um, because this is when it gets good. Okay, so we get our monastic tradition, our subclass, right? And we are taking the new, kind of, and improved, as per Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, the way of the Astral Self. Um, the Astral Self is a little weird, in my opinion. It's a little mystic, a little cosmic, um, but it's really cool, and it is so perfect for what we're trying to do here. The, the synergies um, are just out of this world. So first off, as a bonus action, um, once you hit level three and you first take this this subclass you can spend a key point and you summon your arms of the astral self and it does a little they, they hover near your shoulders or or you know cover your arms however you want it to, to look 
Um, but they, when you first summon them, it does as a bonus action. It does a little nice, a nice little area of effect damage. It's um, within 10 feet of you. Every enemy takes, well, two rolls of your um, your martial arts die, which is still a D4. Unarmed strikes are a D8, but your martial arts die is a D4. But anyway, um, they take two rolls of that as damage, which is nice. Um, but then we get some really cool features from these astral arms. Um, first and foremost, your astral arms can be used to make unarmed strikes. They can even do it with reach, which is great, so a 10-foot attack range. We're not going to be using that very much because we're going to be grappling people and we're going to be, you know, close to them. Um, but you, when, when you make unarmed strike attacks um, with your astral arms, you can use your wisdom modifier instead of your strength or dexterity modifier. So now we're getting a plus four to hit and a plus four to damage thanks to our 18 wisdom instead of our the plus two bonus that we were getting from dex, uh, dexterity. So that's fantastic. And again, they're hitting for, for d8s. Um, that's nice. Also, the damage type is force damage, which will be good in case we run into enemies that are, say, resistant to non-magical bludgeoning attacks or something. Um, equally as important for us, when we when we have our astral arms out, we can make uh, we can use our wisdom modifier in place of our strength modifier when making strength checks and strength saving throws. And athletics, which we're using to grapple, is a strength check. So now we can use our wisdom modifier um, when trying to grapple someone. And uh, and so at this level, that should be, right, since we're proficient in it, it's our proficiency bonus plus our wisdom bonus, so that's a plus six for us at this level. Um, and it's going up soon. So, from here on out, this is what combat looks like for this character. Um, turn one, we run into a bunch of enemies, pull out our astral arms for some, for some nice bonus AoE damage, and, and that's our bonus action. And then we grapple our chosen enemy, right? Um, assuming that you succeed, you're in business. Once you have multi-attack, you can grapple and then make one attack, right? Once you have extra attack, you can grapple because that's taking a, the attack action. It's just a special attack, we're told. And then make, you know, your second attack um, with your astral arms. Um, Let's see, on subsequent turns, assuming the enemy is still grappled, you're basically just going to be pummeling them, right? You're going to be, after extra attack, you're going to be making two unarmed strike attacks, always, always, with your astral arms. And then um, you're getting bonus action unarmed strikes as well. Um, two, if you spend a key point to do it, right? Um, here's the great thing about... about using the astral arms in this way, is that again, when you make a grapple attack, you have to have one arm free, right? For most classes, they, they're they grappling somebody with one arm and pummeling them or maybe hitting them with a weapon with their other hand. With the monk, you could grab one guy and then on, and hit him a couple of times, and then on your next turn, drag him over to his buddy, grab him in a headlock as well, and the whole time you can hold two of them and your astral arms are just going to be pummeling them. Your astral arms are not the things that are making the grapple attack, the grapple checks. It's your actual arms, and your and your um, your astral arms can be free to make unarmed strikes, which is really cool. So now you can potentially control two characters, and not suffer any setback to your damage per round. Um, okay, so at level five. We are a monk four. So now we get a feat or an ability score increase. Um, and I'm gonna recommend, and, and this is very important to this build, that we take the grappler feat. This might be the first time in a build I've ever taken a feat out of the player's handbook. Um, so the grappler feat gives you a couple of things very important. Um, it gives you advantage, first first and most importantly, it gives you advantage on attack rolls versus a creature that you have grappled. Um, oh, guess what? We took Elven Accuracy at level one. So now, all the attacks that we make 
um, assuming that we're succeeding at our grapple checks, are made with triple advantage against those enemies that we have grappled. Um, also, there's, there's a cool feature here um, with the grappler feat. It says that you can try to pin a creature grappled by you. Basically, if you have them grappled, then on a subsequent turn, you make another grapple check. And if you succeed, you pin them to the ground, and now you are both restrained. This, this, gets a, this could potentially get a little weird. Being restrained is great. Um, it would mean that all enemy attacks against you and your foe are made with advantage. So that's bad for you, but great for your team if they're attacking the guy that you've got grappled. Um, but then, since, since they're restrained and you're restrained, those should cancel each other out, right? You're, you're getting advantage on your attacks, but you have disadvantage on, on attacks that you make. That's another condition of being restrained. So those would cancel each other out. However, you are getting the benefit from the feat itself that says you have advantage on enemies that are grappled by you. So I would think that having sort of two sources of advantage and one source of disadvantage, you would still have advantage on your attacks against a pinned enemy. Um, but enemies would have advantage on attacks against you, right? Something to keep in mind, maybe talk it over with your DM if it feels a little... Well, I, I would talk it over with your DM just to make sure that you're on the same page. Also, something potentially weird there is if you have two enemies in a headlock, right? Can you just, do you just pin one of them? Is the other guy still grappled? I would think so. It doesn't really clarify. So clear that up with your DM. Um, you know, maybe you're, you're sitting on one in the headlock, but you still got the other guy, uh, the one that you're sitting on's pinned. Anyway, you can, uh, you can figure it out. Um, anyway, the worst part of the grappler feat as important as it is to our build, is that it requires a 13 strength. I wish so badly that Wizards had not included that prerequisite in the um, Grappler feat. Give it, give it a strength or dex requirement, maybe, right? Um, so otherwise, you know, strength would have been a dump stat for us, but we had to put our strength at 13 so that we could pick up this feat, and that really hurts. Um, because we could have used those points for constitution and hit points. Um, we are very squishy. At level six, you are a monk five, and we finally get our extra attack. Um, we also get stunning strike. So, okay, extra attack again, I'm sure you all know, but now when you take the attack action, you can make two attacks instead of one. So we could grapple and, you know, punch him in the face uh, while we've got him grappled. Um, but again, we also get Stunning Strike. Stunning Strike is a very great monk ability. It's, it's a quintessential monk ability. We spend a key point, and when we hit them with the Nunarm Strike, I think it is, um, they have to make a constitution save, or they are stunned until the end of your next turn. Very strong, very nice. We have very few key points, and um, it's hard to use them on anything other than damage when you're me, um, but maybe you're smarter than me and you're realizing the benefit of stunning an opponent. Uh, it's tough because constitution saves are generally among the higher saves that, that most monsters in D&D have, so they end up getting resisted a lot and it feels really bad to spend a key point um, and not succeed at the stun. I wish that it would get refunded or something if it didn't succeed, but anyway. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a really nice to have. And um, the, the one nice thing I will say is that uh, the, that stun, the stun, the con save that your, that your enemy makes is against your wisdom modifier. Your, your difficulty check is enhanced by your wisdom modifier. So you actually are going to be stunning more reliably than your typical dex based, dexterity based monk, right? Because you have a high wisdom, and that's great. Um, but anyway, Oh, and keep in mind, um, stunned targets automatically fail their grapple check. So if you can land a stun uh, on your enemy, if you're having a hard time grappling them, if you can land a stun on them, you will automatically grapple them, right? They may break it on their turn, but still. Um, actually, they probably won't because they're going to be stunned until the end of your next turn. Anyway, um, it can be a, a nice, there's some nice synergy there if you're having trouble uh, grappling an opponent especially. So from now on, on most turns, 
you're making three attacks to a target, right? You, you get two, two punches with your astral arms um, as your attack action, and then a bonus attack, uh, pummel them again with your astral arms. Four attacks, four, four unarmed strikes in total with your astral arms if you spend a key point for it. Um, they're all doing a d8 plus four damage, your wisdom modifier, and they're all made with triple advantage. Not bad at all. So, time for a damage report. Um, we're gonna assume that you're not getting key on every single attack here, right? It's a, it's a limited resource, and right now you only have five key points, so you won't have them on every, on every turn. But, um, let's see, you're, again, like I said, three unarmed strikes um, against a grappled opponent, plus the d4 at the beginning of the turn, assuming you've got them grappled thanks to our unarmed fighting style. Uh, versus an enemy with a 10 armor class, you're doing 30 damage per round, uh, and against an enemy with a 15 armor class, you're doing 29. It's practically the same because, again, we're, we're making triple advantage attacks on every attack. Um, if you have a key point to spend, and so you get four attacks, then it's 39 at 10 armor class and 38 at 15. Um, not amazing, but not bad, especially considering that you're locking down uh, up to two targets. And... It's about to get much better. And here we go at level seven. We are taking a level in Warlock. Here's the thing about Warlocks. Um, you get a lot for a single level dip. Now, in my first monk build, um, the Munger, Kensei Monk, I went with a Ranger subclass. Um, for basically almost the exact same numerical reasons, uh, that I'm going Warlock here. The nice thing about Ranger is that they need wisdom and dexterity, and monks have high wisdom and dexterity, so it was it was very easy and not mad. Um, but it took three levels in Ranger to get what we can essentially get for one level in Warlock, minus the fighting style, but we don't need the, any fighting styles from Ranger with this build. Um, so... You know, if you just can't stomach using Constitution as a dump stat because it hurts, literally, um, consider going Ranger here instead. But two more levels for the same numerical advantage is a big ask, right? When we're already so multi-classed. Um, what are those numerical advantages? First of all, as a Warlock, um, we get access to the Hex spell which is fantastic. It gives us an extra d6 of damage. You cast it as a bonus action, um, and then and you can transfer it to another enemy as a, as a bonus action on subsequent turns if the one you're fighting dies. Um, but anyway, it does an extra d6 of damage on every attack that you make, and that's really nice, especially if you're making you know four attacks in a turn, spending a key point. Um, and then you also, as a level one warlock get your subclass your patron um, I would say you know that obviously hexblade is an option I would prefer here to go genie um, genie gives us some cool little utility benefits which we won't get into but also once per turn you get to do damage equal to your proficiency bonus when you make an attack so right now for us that's three right it's gonna go up in just a minute um, and yeah so it scales and Eventually, it'll be even better than a d10. Um, and scaling damage, on average, sorry. And scaling damage is uh, one thing that monks sorely lack. So we will take it wherever we can get it. Uh, one other nice thing about warlocks. Even though you only have one spell slot at level one, it refreshes on a short rest. Um, and so you should have it available to you most of the time because A, we're pretty dependent on short rests and hopefully taking a lot of them, and B, we're gonna get even more spell slots because at level eight, we are going druid. <laughs> druid one, more multi-classing. We're almost done, almost, I promise. Um, there's not much to discuss here with a level one druid. Uh, you get some fun, useful, cool dru druid spells and cantrips. Um, pick your poison, thorn whip, it's a great one. You can do damage and pull somebody close to you and away from your backline. Um, but at level nine, 
you're going druid two, and now we're in business. Um, druids get wild shape at level two, which lets you transform into some cool beasts. Um, but you also get to choose your druid circle. And most of you are probably predicting this already, where I'm going here, because uh, we are going to take, you guessed it, the Circle of Spores, which is new-ish to Tasha's. Um, you get two great features for our purposes with this circle. Um, first up, the Halo of, Sp Halo of Spores. So when a creature starts its turn within 10 feet of you, like if they're grappled by you, for example, um, you can use your reaction to do damage to them. Uh, now, the way it's written in the book, this damage scales by character level, not class level. That seems like an anomaly, and it makes me wonder if it was maybe a, an oversight on Wizards of the Coast part to not say that it scales with... Um, druid level, like most abilities that function this way do. Maybe your DM will, will overrule you here, but as written, it scales with character level. So for us right now, it's an extra d6 of damage that you get to do as a reaction to, to an enemy within 10 feet of you. Um, and it's necrotic damage, hooray, not poison. They do get to make a con save against, well, to, to not take the damage, boo. But again, that's against your wisdom modifier, yay. Um, so you have a pretty good chance of, of landing that damage. For, for simplicity's sake, I'm just assuming that they're failing this con save and therefore taking this damage um, every round. Obviously, you know, if you're, especially if you're attacking enemies with a high you know, con save, then your, your damage, the damage numbers that I report are going to be a little lower. Um, but regardless, that's not actually the main reason we are here. The main reason we are here is the symbiotic entity um, feature that Spore Druids get. Um, so as an action, as an action, so try and do this before combat starts, if at all possible. It, it, this feature lasts for 10 minutes when you activate it, so that's not outside the realm of possibility. If it feels like a fight's gonna break out, um, you know, it, it, activate your symbiotic entity. So you expend a use of your wild shape, so instead of transforming into a beast, you you do this symbiotic entity. Um, and again, you have, you have two uses of wild shape per, you guessed it, short rest, um, so that's nice. But anyway, um, you activate this and it awakens your magical spores, giving you some temporary hit points, which are sorely needed by us. Um, and it doubles the damage of your halo of spores. So now that halo of spores reaction does 2d6 instead of 1d6, and it scales all the way up to a d10 eventually, or 2d10. Um, and it gives our attacks an extra d6 of damage, necrotic damage again, woohoo, um, every single attack. So now, between um, Hex and the Circle of Spores druid, we're getting 2d6 per attack, because the Circle of Spores, the symbiotic entity, is not a spell, it does not require concentration, it just requires the use of your wild shape. So it stacks really nicely with Hex. Um, and 2d6 on every single attack, I mean, that's the equivalent of a greatsword, right? Um, so when you're making lots of attacks, that's super awesome. So let's do a damage report for level 9. Again, we are assuming that the target is grappled, and you're making three astral arms attacks each round for an extra, you're rolling a d8, plus 2d6 from Hex and Spores, and then you also get some once per turn damage, the d4 from unarmed fighting style, um, the 2d6 from uh, your circle of spores feature, and uh, four more damage, that's your proficiency bonus, from genie, warlock, right? So all of those added up together. Um, versus an enemy with a 10 armor class, you're doing 65 damage per round on average, and versus an enemy with a 16 armor class, you're doing 63. If you spend a key point to get four attacks, which you can do f not a ton, 
you're still only a monk five, right? But anyway, it's 82 against a 10 AC and 79 against a 16 AC. That is really good. To put it in perspective, without key, so just just with three attacks, you are right up there with the heaviest hitters um, at at kind of mid AC, mid enemy armor class and beyond. Um, and with key, you beat pretty much every other build I've ever done um, at that mid mid enemy armor class and above. Um, again, you only have five key points right now, so that's not super sustainable. But uh, it's it's pretty awesome. All right, at level ten, we're going rogue one. <laughs> I swear, I'm done after this. Um, here's the thing: rogues get a d6 of sneak attack damage once per turn um, if they have advantage on their enemy, and we always do because they're grappled, and we have the grappler feet. Um, that's nice, that's not why we're here. We're here because of the expertise feature that rogues get. Um, expertise, as you probably know, lets you double your proficiency bonus um, on two skills of your choice that you're already proficient in. We are proficient in athletics, and so doubling our, our proficiency bonus there and thereby increasing, greatly increasing our grapple checks is huge and I think worth a level dip. Uh, in fact, so I mean at this level, right, we'd be a plus 12 um, to our grapple checks now. Um, and that's really important for this build. In fact, it's so important that I might say take Rogue 1 at level 7 instead of waiting until now, right, before your Warlock and your Druid levels, um, especially if you care more about landing that grapple than you do about your damage per round. Um, so yes, Rogue One. Um, at level 11, we're going back to Monk. See, I told you, I was done. Um, so we're, we're Monk 6 now, and at Monk 6, your movement speed goes up by 5 feet. Um, your unarmed strikes are magical for the purpose of overcoming resistance to non-magical attacks, but ours already were because we we're making all of our attacks with our astral arms. Um, and you can now summon, um, for an additional key point, you can summon your visage of the astral self in addition to the arms, which gives you some cool utility abilities that we are not going to go into here. At level 12, you are a monk seven. Um, you get evasion. And that's fantastic. Um, basically, if you succeed on a deck save against um, like an area effect spell or damage, um, then you take no damage instead of half. And if you fail, you take half. Um, that's really important for us. And we also get stillness of mind as a monk that lets us end a charmed or frightened effect on us without having to succeed at a saving throw. It costs our action. Uh, but it's really nice that we're getting sort of some abilities here to reduce damage from spells and reduce spell effects and things on us as squishy as we are. At level 13, we are a monk 8. Finally, we get another ability score increase. Um, or feat. We're taking the ability score increase, we're going wisdom, and we're finally going to cap our wisdom at 20, so now we're a plus 5 to hit and plus 5 to damage with those unarmed strikes, which is really nice. So, let's do a damage report. Um, versus a an enemy with a 10 armor class, on average we're doing 75 damage per round. And against an enemy with a 17 armor class, we're doing 74. Because of all of those sweet, sweet... Um, Elven accuracy advantage fueled attacks. Um, you know, we have enough key points now that you could probably count on being able to do four attacks half the time, I would say, depending on how many combats you have between short rests and how long your combat rounds tend to go. Uh, encounters, I should say, tend to go. But anyway, if you're spending key, um, you're averaging 93 
damage per round against a 10 armor class and 91 against 17. Um, almost hit the centennial barrier at level 13 as a monk. Um, better than any other build that I've done as, at a 17 armor class. Um, so yeah, that's that's awesome. Check the graphs. I, 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 I keep forgetting to mention this. I, again, I, I crunch the numbers, I put graphs, they're in the show notes. Check them out um, so you can compare you know, this build to other builds that I've done. Um, I hope that. All right, at level 14, we are a monk nine. Um, we can now run up vertical surfaces and across liquids. So cool. Dungeon Masters, please give your monks opportunities to do this in game, even if it's meaningless and just fun and neat. Um, at level 15, we are a monk 10. Um, we get five more feet of movement speed, and we are immune to disease and poison, which is super nice for our squishy selves. At level 16, we are a monk 11, and we get the body of the astral self feature. Um, it's really cool. So when you have both of your both your arms and your uh, visage uh, out, then you can summon the whole astral body, which covers your own body like a suit of armor. Um, it's kind of a cool image. As a reaction now, with the astral body out, we can reduce acid, cold, fire, lightning, etc. damage by a d10 plus our wisdom score, modifier that is, um, again as a reaction, so you'd have to choose between that and doing the damage from your um, halo of spores, right? But still really nice, again, for our squishy selves. Um, but then also when you hit an enemy, with an unarmed strike from your astral arms, you get to do once per turn an extra d8 of damage. Um, uh, it's a martial arts die of damage, uh, which is a d8 right now. Um, every little bit helps, so that's great. At level 17, it's hard for me to know, it's hard for me to decide what to take at level 17. On the one hand, Going Monk would take us to Monk 12, and that would give us another ability score increase or feat. You'd probably want to go Dexterity, and that would bump your armor class most importantly, but also your initiative and acrobatics and stealth and all of those things. Um, we, we got a bump to our armor class, by the way, when we capped our wisdom, so now we're at a 17 armor class, right? Um, so that would put us at an 18 if we went Monk level here, uh, plus another key point, which we always need. Um, that's tempting. Another level of Warlock would give us um, Eldritch Invocations, which obviously are great. I, since I'm trying to optimize this for damage, um, I'm probably going to go Fighter. Fighter level 2. Because um, Action Surge is so good. And it refreshes on a short rest, which we're taking a lot of. And so, you know, when you, when you use Action Surge, you'd be getting 6 attacks in a round. You know, all with the, those bonuses added to them, it just, it, it's a lot of damage. Um, but obviously, you do what you feel like you need to do. Um, yeah, so I'm going to say fighter level 2. Damage report. Our final damage report, again, as a refresher. Our once per turn damage consists of grappling bonus, d4, halo of spores damage, which I believe right now is a 2d10. Um, we've got a, our genie bonus, which is a, a six, six, flat six damage, our sneak attack, which is a 1d6, and our astral body d8 of damage once per turn, five sources. Um, and then each unarmed strike attack is doing 1d8 plus 2d6 plus five, all made with triple advantage, um, thanks to hex and spores, right? Um, that's a lot. That's a lot of damage sources. Um, versus a 10 enemy armor class. We're doing 83 damage per round if we're not spending key. 83 damage per round. Um, against an enemy with 18 armor class, we're doing 82 damage per round. Now, that's good, but with key, and you know, at this point, if we're a monk 11 or 12, we can assume that you're going to have a key point to spend every turn on pretty much 
every turn in combat. I'm going to assume that. Based on my own personal experience, you know, most combat encounters last four to six rounds. Um, and if you're taking a short rest every two combat encounters, you should have key, unless you're spending your key for other things, right? Deflecting arrows or dashing or stunning strike. I mean, and you might be, but it's possible, right? It's possible that you would have it on just about every turn. So I would say that assuming four attacks per round is sustainable here. Um, and at that point you're doing 101 damage per round to an enemy with a 10 armor class and 99 against an enemy with an 18 armor class as a monk. Um, that's fantastic. And if you use action surge, which you know, you'll be able to do once in a while against a big bad, it's 137 and 135 damage per round. Um, your scaling did slow a little bit in these last few rounds, so you're not quite keeping up uh, with the very heaviest hitters, and by that I mean the Bladesinger with their top level spell going, you know, um, and the Death Cleric, assuming they have two enemies that are standing next to each other, and the Great Weapon Master, Polar Master, Hexblade, Pamlock, um, at least until a very high armor class. Uh, so even with key, you're not quite keeping up, but you're very close and you're very strong and you're beating everybody else. Um, all while, all let's not forget, all while grappling two enemies, right? And shutting down, or at least keeping them from moving, um, two enemies, which is just fantastic. It gives great control and phenomenal damage per round. All right, final thoughts. This build, it was so much fun to put together, and it was so surprisingly powerful. Um, again, through through mid game, it's it might be the the strongest sustained damage per round build I've I've come up with, at least against you know kind of that mid sort of average enemy armor class and above, um, while also adding some fantastic control options. Um, Yes, I will admit, all of the multi-classing makes it a little bit out there, even for me. Um, don't get mad at me for jumping through all these hoops. Get mad at Wizards of the Coast for making me jump through all these hoops in order to get monk uh, sustained damage uh, uh, competitive. But, um, you know, there are a couple of reasons why you might not be able to pull off this build exactly as I've laid it out here in-game. Um, reason number one... Your DM just might not be hip to that much multi-classing. Um, they might not allow it straight up, or they might just kind of frown on it, or make you come up with a really good, you know, reason, roleplay reason, story reason for why you're dipping into five or six different classes. I think I'm going to talk about this actually in my sliding into my DMs um, episode later this week. Um, cause some, I, I get a lot of people, you know, saying that they can't multi-class or they can't take more than one multi-class or something like that. Um, so we'll talk about that more, but another reason, you know, y you might just be too squishy. Um, you, you, you have a low con and not a fantastic, um, armor class, especially through most of the game until later. Um, and you're only a d8 of hit die, you know, character to begin with. I love to theory craft, as you guys know. Um, my main purpose here is to sort of explore the limits of what is possible. Um, of course, D&D combat does not happen in a vacuum, and the enemies actually fight back. So if you have to drop some things in order to reduce your squishiness, um, I would probably start with the Warlock. You can drop that first. It's tough because it's only one level and it gives us so much, but that 13 Charisma requirement is hard. Um, and, and we could use those points in Constitution and, and, and save ourselves or give ourselves a lot more hit points. Um, if I were to go for the next thing that I'd consider dropping, it would probably be the grappler feet uh, I hate that I hate giving that up too because that's that advantage is so nice um, but it's our 13 strength and it's the only thing we need strength for um, 
So that's something to consider. Of course, if you don't have advantage, well, you know, if we're not multi-classing so much, we'll have more key points to spend on potentially stunning our targets. And if the target's stunned, we're going to get advantage against him anyway. Um, so, you know, that's 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 worth considering potentially giving up if, if you're looking for a way to get points and more points into your constitution. Um, if you're starting low levels, I would really hate to give up that that fighter dip um, because the fighting style is so nice, especially at low levels. Um, you could, again, if you're not multi-classing so much, you will get a little more access to feats and ability score increases. So you could maybe just take the fighting initiate feat later and pick up that fighting style. But the longer you wait for it, the less useful it is, the less of a buff it becomes, right? Because eventually you will get to a D8 for your unarmed strikes as a monk. Um, and it's going to take you a while. So that kind of depends on if you're starting low level or not. Um, do your utmost to at least hold on to the rogue level for expertise, because that's huge. And again, we are primarily a grappler here. Um, and, and having expertise for our athletics ability is big. And the, you know, the sneak attack is nice. Um, but it's only a d6. It's not huge. Anyway, the, the rogue, and, and we already have a high deck, so there's no mad, there's no madness going on there. Um, and your druid, your druid levels, because again, we already have a high wisdom, so it's, it's an easy multi-class dip. Um, and we do get a lot of damage out of it and some nice, you know, spells and utility and things too that I didn't really get into. Um, that would let you have a higher constitution and also hopefully be able to more quickly put points into your wisdom and then decks to increase your armor class to just make you, you know, tankier overall. You're, you're going to do a lot less damage, but maybe that's worth it to you. Um, I will say that if you have a good party, you know, and you've got a, if you've got a good healer and or buffer or controller and or a tank that can do a decent job of kind of trying to draw enemy fire, this build will work. And it'll work great as long as your DM's okay with um, all the multi-classing and it will be super fun and super powerful. Um, if I had my, to, if I got to pick a magic item for this build, my number one magic item pick would be um, an amulet of health, which buffs your constitution to a 19, and that solves almost all of our problems with squishiness. It would practically double your hit points. Um, runner up would be abrasers of protection for a plus two to armor class, or a cloak of protection, or a ring of protection, which are plus one each. Um, those would all be really great for you. I guess if we're making a Christmas list, add uh, the new Eldritch Claw tattoo, which bumps your unarmed strike damage, um, or the Coiling Grasp tattoo, which lets you grapple yet another target, and from 15 feet away um, to that list. I promised some racial alternatives. Here's my list of racial alternatives that would be fantastic for this build. The Loxodon. The, the elephant-esque um, race, they can make a grapple with their trunk. So you could grapple three enemies, arm, arm, trunk, and still pummel all of them with your, um, with your astral arms. Um, maybe even better would be the Simic Hybrid. Uh, Simic Hybrid eventually can get these grappling appendages, which and you'd get two of them, and so they can each grapple somebody the, the DC is lower, I think it's a 14, um, so you might not succeed as often, but still. Two more grappling options, so you can have four grappled targets altogether, which is a, a, kind of a hilarious image, but would be really cool. You are, you are r Randy Macho Man Savage on steroids, um, grappling the entire uh, enemy uh, team. Um, Bugbear. Bugbear would be great because they get uh, they, they have a reach of 10 feet instead of 5, right? And so you could just be snagging guys as they're trying to run past you to your back line, um, which would be really nice. My favorite of all of the racial alternatives um, is the Aracocra. This gets a little complicated, and I know we're already long, so bear with me here. Aracocras get to fly innately, right? Um, Here's what you could theoretically do. Um, run up, 
grapple somebody, and then fly. 50 feet, you have 50 feet of movement speed, and you can spend a key point and take a bonus action dash, right? So now you can fly 100 feet up in the air, um, and then drop them. And the latest rules, I think from Xanathar's, uh, state that falling up to 500 feet happens instantly. These, these are things you'd have to work out with your DM if you wanted to try this, but anyway. They'd fall 100 feet and take 10d6 falling damage, right? Um, then, as per Tasha's, now Tasha's Cauldron of Everything on page 170 talks about falling on somebody and damage that, that they might take. And it essentially says that if you fall on someone, you you essentially split the falling damage between you and the the, the guy you land on. So that's another 5d6 of damage for them. And you are a monk, and you have slow fall um, by level 4. And slow fall lets you reduce the damage that you take from falling by 5 times your monk level, which on average is going to be more than 5d6 that you would have taken from falling. Um, so, <laughs> so you could grapple them, fly up in the air 100 feet, drop them, and then fall down and land on them. Talk about the ultimate Superfly Sinuka um, off the top ropes move. Um, I love it. It's a little cheesy, um, but it's, it's actually really good damage. I don't know if the damage outpaces, like at later levels when you get Hex and Spores and all of those things. I haven't actually crunched the numbers. My hunch is that eventually it doesn't scale as well, but it's a nice damage alternative if you don't want to do all that multi-classing. Um, again, it is a little cheesy. It might get a little old in game if every single turn you're goppling somebody, flying up 100 feet, dropping them, falling back down on them. It's kind of like, it'd be cool once in a while if it was every turn, it'd be like, all right, super fly. Um, but it would be cool and fun and hilarious. It wouldn't work indoors as well, but anyway. Um, it's an alternative and something to consider. I'd, I'd do it for a one shot at least. It would be a lot of fun. That is our show for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, please do all of the things like, subscribe, share, review, comment, um, and I appreciate it. We're, we're, we're having some really nice growth lately. Last I checked, we were up to like 2,200 subscribers. That's fantastic. Um, let's keep it going. Please don't forget to check out our um, Reddit, our subreddit, uh, which I'm putting along the bottom here. Um, that community is growing nicely too, and I hope you guys will continue to use it and talk amongst yourselves when I can't get to every single comment that uh, people make in the videos and things like that. I do check that subreddit. I don't comment a lot on them, but I, I read every post, at least I have been so far, and um, you know, uh, chiming in when I can. Um, but of course, we're also on um, Facebook and Twitter. So, you know, do what you want to try and reach out to me. I love to hear your guys' feedback and even your corrections and your ideas and, uh, and everything. Um, as always, if you have a build that you'd really like me to take a look at, give me as much detail as you can on it as far as what your goal is and, uh, you know, any multiclassing that you're trying to do and all of those kinds of things and uh, send it my way, and I will do my best to optimize it for you. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. I love you so much, and we will talk to you soon.